Okay, so fostering engagement and motivation online. I, the, the aim of this talk is to be something quite simple, quite straightforward. Um, I'm not really going to be talking about lots of apps and platforms and things. I, I want to kind of just keep it quite simple and, and have a share a few ideas and a, a, some thoughts about how we can exploit more familiar traditional textbook exercises, paper-based exercises um, in the online environment. So at the end of the day, hopefully you'll take away a few actual ideas that maybe I've given you. But the main thing is, let's just think about how we can take advantage of the online environment, the online platform to maybe further exploit our material, to further engage and motivate our learners. Okay, so to begin with, can you all see the map? In fact, a quick question, can you all see and hear me okay? A quick yes or no? Yes, John. Yep. Yes, John. Yep. Great, yeah. okay. And can you see the arrow? The arrow is pointing at Oxford. That arrow is pointing at me. Now, we've just had a quick, you know, you've, you've said where you're all from. Here's a question. Who thinks they are the nearest to me in Oxford? And who thinks they are the furthest away from me? So if you think the nearest, put nearest and where you're from. Albania, Tunisia, anyone nearer than Albania? Anyone further than Tunisia, Georgia? Hera, furthest away, where are you, Hera? Czech Republic is quite near, Poland, China, Indonesia is probably the furthest, Vietnam, Indonesia, Brazil, Peru. Okay. So, yeah, we've got some Indonesia, Vietnam. Did I see Argentina? Yes. Uruguay, slightly nearer than Argentina, I would imagine. The South Pole. I think the South Pole probably wins it. <clears throat> Who thinks they're the nearest? We've had Bulgaria, we've had a few European countries, Ukraine, hi. Who thinks they're the nearest? Is anyone in the UK? <clears throat> When I gave the webinar this morning, there was somebody who is about 20 or 30 miles away from me. Okay, 6,000 kilometers from Oxford, okay. Birmingham, Emily, I think Emily's the winner for the nearest Birmingham, hi Birmingham. I hope the weather in Birmingham is better than it is, is here in Oxford. Okay, let's move on. So this talk, uh, this webinar talk, uh, workshop, if you like, online workshop, uh, is gonna be three things. We will look at the general notion of engagement motivation and at how personalizing material can be a very key useful way of promoting engagement and motivation. So we'll, we'll look at that in a sort of general sense, not just online, but bearing in mind all the way through, it's particularly important uh, for online. We'll then look at some language practice exercises. We'll begin by looking at one or two that I don't think are engaging and motivating. And then we'll look at some alternatives, which I do propose are engaging and motivating. Again, these could be face-to-face -face in the classroom course book exercises. And then we'll move on and look at considerations and adaptions, how we can tweak, um, exploit the material just to make it maybe a little more engaging and motivation in an online context. Okay, so, Let's start thinking about online. Um, we've all gone online. Some of us can't wait to get back in the classroom. Some of us, it's great that we have got back in the classroom. However, for some people, I think online learning, you know, it, it is here to stay. It will endure. It works for some people. I personally much prefer the face to face. I like to be able to see out the corner of my eye, someone's facial expression, someone's body language. Have they got it? Have they got a question? You can't really pick up on those things as much online from my experience. Um, and that to me is kind of at the heart of what teaching really is, okay? Um, the second quote is by Laura Patsko from her paper published by Macmillan, Insights and Challenges into Challenges of Distance and Teaching and Learning. And this one summary, I think, sums it up. Uh, keeping students motivated and engaged during online and hybrid lessons is far more difficult compared to face to face. I kind of would agree with that to a certain extent. I teach university students 
I haven't really had such a problem, but I can see it, it, you know, there's a kind of barrier, isn't there? A little space between you and the camera and the screen. I think that level of engagement isn't quite there as much. Um, I gave a talk to some teachers from Gdansk University um, about two weeks ago, actually, two or three weeks ago. And they did their own very thorough um, survey of their teachers. And 48.5, almost half the teachers reported more passivity from the students. The students were more passive in the classrooms. They were less involved, less active. And 83% of the teachers at, in this Gdansk University survey said there was worse inter, interpersonal communication between the students, possibly between the students and teacher as well. But you know, the pair work activities, group work activities, um, et cetera, uh, there was less engagement, less interpersonal connections and communications, which again, would reflect my experience to a certain extent. So that was some, some great uh, uh, survey and some data from Gdansk University, which uh, I asked if I can use that data um, and they, they said, fine. So when I first started thinking about this talk or the first incarnation of this talk, I should say, um, I asked some teachers, um, what are your, kind of prerequisites how do you approach online how do you keep your students motivated and engaged and this is a few of the things that some of my teacher colleagues said teachers from different countries okay uh, i'll leave you to have a look at those do any of those statements resonate with you particularly do you connect with any of them do you agree strongly with any of them do you disagree with any of them i'm just going to give you a few seconds um, to have a look at those statements and as i said then we'll just look at them individually but do, do do they resonate with you do do you agree do you do this <clears throat> Natalia agrees with most, and I've just missed your name. You've disappeared off the screen. Doesn't have to, uh, Maria. I don't have time for number one. Yes, time is the essence, isn't it? On um, online, it can be always difficult to get teens engaged. Again, it depends who your students are. Motivated postgrad university students, teenagers, young children. Okay, so as I said, you know, I, I put out a request, you know, how do you help with motivation, with engagement? Um, and these are some of the things. So the first one, relationship, building a team, a safe space, certainly at the start of a course, icebreakers, warmers, timeouts, let the participants choose partners. Okay, you might have to manage it a little bit, but it's all about building a team, building a, a, a sort of unit of, of, of trust. Students want to interact with each other. Okay. I agree with not all of them, Miranda. Well, yes, as I said, this is a, a range of ideas. Lead-ins. I think we all do lead-in activities in the classroom. Perhaps they're even more important in the online classroom. Okay. Get students talking as early in the lesson as possible. I kind of think that's quite an important thing. That if you do a lot of speaking, a lot of talking, the students get sort of zoned on the screen. And then when they have to speak, I think it's, it's maybe a little more difficult if we can get them speaking at the beginning. And this teacher has general chit chat, which they call what's up. OK, let's do five minutes of what's up. What did you do? What's going on? And so on and so on. OK. Uh, a total break. I, I basically do that. I have 90 minute classes at the university after 45 minutes or thereabouts depending there's often a nice natural break at the end of an activity or the end of a section let's disappear for two three four five minutes stop looking at the screen stretch your legs uh, and then come back okay instructions are important always important of course instruction checking icqs or whatever uh, they, they're called on, on on celta these days but again, online particularly, because if you've got a student in a, in a breakout room who hasn't quite got the instruction, you're not really there on hand to help out, okay? Mediation, now mediation has become a bit of a buzz 
Um, in ELT world, what do we mean by mediation? Well, mediation, it's simple form. I think it simply means passing on information. It could be passing on information in an accessible way. So maybe the core information is less accessible. You can make it more accessible. Paraphrasing, reporting, <clears throat> etc. But I think mediation essentially simply means, you know, just passing on information, connecting information, uh, rather than always talking about yourself. And again, I think this connects with the first one, building relationships, building a team. Yes, if I can tell you about this person or we can talk about this person, that's part of the team, team building. It's not just me, me, me it, and the teacher. I like the next one. <clears throat> As a materials writer, it's essentially all about the activity. If the activity itself is engaging, that's half the battle, at least. OK, the students are more likely to be involved, uh, and engaged and motivated. That's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at sort of starting with engaging activities, first and foremost, and then how we can exploit them a little bit more. <clears throat> uh, a lot of it is just about common sense. And this is kind of the main message of, of this, this session. Hopefully at the end, you'll agree with me. I'll give you a few examples of what I see as just being common sense, maybe slightly creative ways of adapting the exercise. We don't need fancy apps, et cetera, et cetera. Although we can use them, of course, but you know, just a little bit of creative thinking, a bit of common sense. How can I exploit this online, in the online environment, in the easiest way possible? And finally, more than in face-to-face, -face, perhaps students need to be intrinsically motivated. We need to create conditions for that. Again, I'm kind of agreeing with that um, approach, yes? Intrinsic motivation comes from within the learner. If we, if, we, if we can instill this intrinsic motivation, if the learner is intrinsically motivated, fantastic. How can we do that? Well, this is what we'll look at now. So what we're gonna do first is have a little look at the notion of motivation. Okay, quick, Desi and Ryan, who some of you may be familiar with, have done, you know, motivation in education is their thing. More powerful and sustained learning happens when learners are motivated from within or intrinsically. Okay, so that's the kind of starting point. And maybe some of you are familiar with this. I'm so sure some of you out there are more aware of this than I am, more knowledgeable about this. Intrinsic motivation, three key concepts. Uh, what are these three th key concepts that Desi and Ryan, this is a distillation of, of, of you know, a, a few decades of work, but I think applicable to the ELT classroom, particularly applicable to online, are these three things. I'll just let you look at those for a few seconds. Competence, autonomy, and relatedness. And these three things kind of interact. And I think this is just a good little tick list, a little checklist to have. Competence, to enhance, to encourage intrinsic motivation. The tasks need to be com com the tasks need uh, to be achievable. They need to be doable. I know it's kind of obvious, but you know, particularly online as well, when you're less able to monitor, you're less able to nudge people along if they're in breakout rooms. We need to think about the tasks uh, being competent, uh, the, the competence level of, of the students. Can they do the tasks? The tasks are doable. Autonomy. The learner needs agency. What do we mean by agency? Well, some, some, some ownership, some say, some voice, some choice. Now, I know some teachers, I've seen some webinars where at one end of the spectrum, you say to the students, you choose which activity you want to do. Do you want to do this one, this one, this one? Do you want to talk about this, this or this? So that's autonomy in its extreme. Uh, but also what I'm thinking about when I say choice and voice and ownership, you can say what you want. So instead of being forced to drill or articulate certain sentences, you, you have the ability, you know, that the student can personalize the, the communication. They have choice, they have voice of what they want to say. And as I said, Desi and Ryan have sort of established that autonomy, ownership, agency, choice, et cetera, as a key element, okay? Um, Relatedness, and these are kind of connected. The learner needs to feel valued, connected, can relate to the task, can relate to the language, can relate to the topic, but can relate to the task. Is it a kind of task that the learner 
can be involved in and wants to be involved in. Okay, so I think these three core ideas are something we should always have in the back of our mind in the face to face classroom, but they're perhaps particularly important online. Okay, I'm going to add also Fraser McGee, and that connects with one of the things on the previous slide a sense of belonging. I think if the students feel they're part of the group, they want to interact with their, their other students, they want to talk, they want to ask questions. Uh, I, think, I think that's another prerequisite as well. And the two can feed each other. Interesting interactive tasks that the students want to do and they feel related to can help with the sense of belonging and vice versa. Okay. Here's another way of putting the same thing. You're probably familiar with this, the classic flow channel. Again, particularly important online. So you present language, new language, review language, or whatever the task is. A1, you're in the flow channel. The aim, of course, is to stay in the flow channel. However, again, if we relate back to Desi and Ryan's three key notions, three, three concepts, if the material isn't relatable, the learner has no autonomy, the learner has no voice, they can't express of themselves, that may lead to boredom. So they drift out into the A2 zone. If at the same time, again, Desi and Ryan's competence factor, if there's too much challenge, if it's beyond their competency, that could lead to anxiety. The challenge is too high, okay? And they drift out of the flow channel. Get the right amount of challenge, relatability, coupled with autonomy and voice, a4, we will hopefully keep the learner within the flow channel. Now that's, as I said, you know, uh, I've always found it just a useful little, another thing in the back of my mind when I'm choosing material, writing material, um, particularly important online perhaps. Okay. And a few more uh, things, um, just setting the scene. Um, Gertrude Moskovich, you may be aware of, this lady. She's a New Yorker, despite her very European kind of sounding name. We think of communicative language teaching, interactive personalization as being quite a recent thing. Back in 1978, <clears throat> fantastic book. I haven't actually read the whole book, Daphne, but maybe I should. Um, for learning to be significant, feelings must be recognized and put to use. Okay. Uh, and that was back in 1978. That was what she was saying about the English language classroom. Back in 1978, a lot of it was translation, mechanical exercises. This is one of the first, when, you know, the first sort of steps into interactive engagement and communication. Uh, more recently, Sue Kay and Vaughan Jones, friends of mine, colleagues of mine, authors of the wonderful Inside Out series. <clears throat> when students are engaged in meaningful activities on a personal level, rather than going through the motions. We'll look at some going through the motions in a moment. And uh, more recently, Dean Burnett in The Idiot Brain. Things that have emotional resonance or significant tend to be more easily remembered than abstract information. OK, I think we'd all agree with this. So this is kind of setting the scene. This is kind of at the heart of my hopefully my teaching and my material writing, particularly relevant online just to help get the students engaged and motivated. So let's look at some activities now. Here are some which I suggest do not tick those boxes. I think this really is going through the motion. There's no relating, relatability. There's no autonomy. The student doesn't have any, any voice. It's a purely mechanical and as Sue and Vaughan said, going through the motions kind of activity. That's the dog which always barks at, barks at night. It's also not a very natural sentence, I'm afraid. Yes, I don't think you'd actually say that in the real world. Just to digress for a moment, I think what we do in the classroom and what materials writers should do, you should only produce material language that the students might actually hear or might actually articulate. Yeah, so that sentence, the concept, fine, but I don't think that sentence is a particularly, that's the dog which always barks at night. You'd, you'd phrase it slightly differently. Oh, that's the dog, you know, the, the one I was telling you about, the one that keeps barking. I don't think you'd have that nice little neat sentence. And here's another one, which I think is even crazier. My sister, whose husband lives in Paris, had a baby yesterday. 
would you ever say, would anyone ever actually say that sentence? My sister, whose husband lives in Paris, had a baby yesterday. What a crazy thing to say. Relative pronouns. Yes, exactly. Um, oh, my sister had a baby. You know, the one, the one whose husband lives in Paris. You might say that, but you would never say that. I need a car which won't break down. Oh, good. I think most of us probably need a car that won't break down. Andrew's dog, which he got from a dog's home, loves cats. This is the classic going through the motions, non-relatable. You've got no voice, you've got no say, it's not really relatable. It's just purely mechanical going through the motion. So if we think back about the quotations, it serves a very minimal purpose. It's very mechanical. It's focusing on formal decorative mastery. Yes, I can choose the drop down window whose, I can choose which, I can choose that, etc. But that's all it's really doing. Yes, there is a place for that. But I think we can do more. And as uh, these other two quotations say, I think we can contrive a situation in which the learner is learned, simultaneously alert to form and meaning. The previous ones were just purely focused on form, very grammatical, but I think we can, we can get form and meaning together. Okay. How do we do this? Well, as the great Scott Thornbury once wrote, uh, the great challenge is to set up activities which are essentially meaning focused, within which a focus on form can be engineered. So if we go back to these, you could write a book in a day if you just literally just write all these crazy, decontextualized, nonsensical, unrealistic, unnatural sentences. But I think the key thing is, my why you need to think why in the real world might we use this language here's what we might say let's engineer an exercise where we can also focus on form as well so here's an example from language hub uh, an exercise that i wrote um, which hopefully does focus on form it's very similar to the exercise we just saw yes it's it's in it's in the course book not on a drop down window but you choose the you choose the correct relative pronoun, miss out the relative pronoun impossible, but then complete the sentence with your own idea. That's giving you some agency, isn't it? Some voice, some say, some relatedness, some relatability. Okay, and it's very achievable. Yes, famous person I admire is Michelle Obama. A charity which does do a lot of good is Oxfam. Someone who has influenced me a lot was my first English teacher and so on. So this, I hope you get, I hope this is clear. This is the focus on form, but at the same time, we're making it relatable, achievable. Okay. Hopefully the student will want to do it. They're not just going through the mechanical grammar motions. Okay. Here's another exercise that I wrote for Language Hub in the B1. Classic prepositions, money expressions. But you can see what I've done here. I have not just random sentences. David spends most money on computer games. Samantha never lends money to her friends. You know, I've constructed it so they're actually questions. So you do the same focus on form, this Scott Formby quote. Yes, engineer a focus on form into some real communication. Of course, what can you do here? You do the exercise. Then in pairs, in small groups, the students can ask and answer the questions. There's no deep discussion going on here, but it is the kind of questions that you may ask each other. OK, so these are course book exercises originally designed pre pandemic for use in the classroom. What we're going to look at in a short while is how we can take this and maybe even slightly tweak it, slightly adapt it to be used online. OK, and here's one more. Make and do, the classic make and do in a lot of languages, there's the single verb that sometimes translates as do and sometimes translates as make. It's a classic ELT thing. <clears throat> Here's a simple little exercise. What can you do? In pairs, in groups, when was the last time? Well, I made a mess. I made some pierogi yesterday and I got flour everywhere. When did you make a mistake? I booked a ticket on the wrong day last week it was a big mistake blah 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 yeah again you're just relating to it you're having some voice some agency and so on and so on 
Okay. So, <clears throat> however, just to digress for a moment, if you do want these classic mechanical uh, decontextualized set sentences, which of course there is a place for this, for maybe extra practice, practice on your own, a bit of consolidation, a real focus on the form. Language Hub Online does have these kind of activities. So similar to the ones we looked at at the beginning. However, I think the big difference is these sentences are all pretty natural sentences, realistic language, not these crazy sentences. My sister whose husband lives in Paris had a baby. Uh, my dog that he got, you know, th these are kind of more realistic sentences. Okay. For example, yeah. So Language Herb Online does have this more traditional uh, practice as well. Okay, and that's very similar. It's hard to make a living. And with this one, you could be, as I said at the beginning, it's just about being creative, thinking outside the box. It's hard to make a living an artist, but I'm glad I don't work in an office. Okay, there's a launch pad for some discussion. Okay, does anyone make a living working in an office? Would you rather not working in an office? What are the pros and cons of working in office? I hate doing the ironing. It's the one job I really can't stand. Okay, let's have a vote. Who likes ironing? Who, who hates ironing? Who doesn't mind ironing? Yeah, again, you can just make it so, you know, personalize exactly. Franco, we can personalize information. So you can develop a little bit of discussion just to get give the students some, uh, some agency, some relatedness and so on. Okay, so the, the final section, uh, we've looked at the concept of uh, intrinsic motivation, which I think is pretty essential in the classroom, particularly online. We've looked at how course book activities, uh, exercises, language exercises can, uh, have ticked some of the intrinsic motivation boxes. And what we'll do now is look at how we can even further maybe exploit these to make them even more engaging online. So there are the two exercises. In a course book, maybe you've got the course book, but what can we maybe do? So you, you've done the exercise and you want to send the students off to breakout rooms, or maybe you want to do a whole class thing where they ask and answer the questions, or they tell each other their sentences. I think it's useful to give the students a reason to do that. When you come back out of the breakout room, I want you to mediate. I want you to give us some feedback. It gives the learner a reason. And if they realize that they have to play the game, they have to be involved, then they're possibly, and I say possibly, more likely to do so. So for example, something very simple. And here are just, I'm just going to give you three ideas, but again, you can, you can use your own creativity. Okay, do those questions, speak those sentences, and then I want you to report back in your breakout room group of three people, four people, two people, six people, whatever it is. You can input some language, most of us, half of us, a few of us, all of us. Yeah, you could throw in a bit more language. Most of us think the climate crisis is an important thing. OK, about half of us use our phone to pay for things. OK, only one of us pays regularly pays for things in cash. And so on. Maria, yes, it's giving the students a reason to do it. As I said, it's no big deal. It's not a big TBL task based thing. It's just a little thing that we can do that just makes going in the breakout room gives them a bit more of a reason. Report it. This idea of mediation. OK, I'm going to tell everybody a famous person Daria admires is Bruno spends most money on. You can either put them in repairs to report on each other or it could be an open class thing. Or you could turn it into a bit of a quiz. OK, everybody, what do you think? You know, Bruno. What do you think he spends mo most money on? And again, this is part of the sense of belonging, the sense of a safe space and a team where the students want to interact. Very simple stuff. But again, it just gives the learner a reason to do the exercise. You may know the English phrases chalk and cheese. If two people are like chalk and cheese, they're very different. If two people are peas in a pod, they're very similar. So again, okay, do the exercise. And then I want you to decide who is the most similar to you, who has the least similar ideas. Simple thing. Okay, well, yeah, I think Joanna and me are the most sim similar. Ali and me, perhaps the least similar. Okay. 
So there are just three ideas of when you send them into the breakout room, in a word, try and think of a reason for them to do the activity, to do a little bit of feedback when they come out of it. Okay. Um, but using technology, I just want to mention, you know, a couple of apps. I'm, I guess, is anyone familiar with Answer Garden? Quick yes, no. Sure. Malvina, I'm sure that's a sure. No, 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 no. A few no's, mostly no's. Okay, yes, fine. So very quickly, there's lots of technology. There are lots of apps. There are lots of platforms that you can use, Google Docs, etc. cetera. Uh, as I said, my, the focus of this talk is just to sort of keep it as simple as possible and, and as, as tech free as possible. However, Answer Garden is a great little tool. It's free. You can set up a question. You send the link to your students. You can post it in chat, for example, and they can visit this page. So even though it's sort of getting out of Zoom, it, it's pretty straightforward and, and easy to set up. And if we go back to the activity, a famous person that I admire, who I admire or just I admire is. And what they do, you can then share this on your share screen. They can see it themselves. And as somebody puts in an answer, it appears. So you get Greta Thunberg appears, Malala appears, Kurt Cobain appears, little by little. OK, very exploitable. I'm sure you can think of things you can do with this. OK, let's guess who said Kurt Cobain. Let's guess who said Elon Musk. Again, it's part of building this, you know, sense of community. OK, who said Greta? Why did you say Greta? And so on and so on. Mentimeter is similar, exactly. Uh, Answer Garden is very, very simple and straightforward. Uh, there's lots of apps out there. Answer Garden is one that's good. But as I said, they appear in front of you. As I said, all sorts of little ex ex exploitations, okay? Which of these do you think I would say? It's a free app, yeah. Yes. I think I'd go with David Attenborough. Kurt, absolutely, yeah. David Attenborough, the Dalai Lama, Greta, Malala, Ang Angela Merkel. I'm not, yeah, I probably wouldn't go with the others anyway. Fine. Okay, so you can see how you can exploit it. And here's the one on the what do you spend most money on? And again, they still have to put in the preposition wine. OK, who said wine? Who said socialising? Who said going out? Records and so on and so on and so on. OK, and again, it's just another fun way of, of you know, exploiting. The students have some voice, they can relate to it and so on and so on. Another one, are you familiar with Word Wall? A quick yes or no? No, 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 yes, 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 no. Word Wall is great. Again, it's very simple, it's very free. You set it up, you send them the link, they go to the page. So you can see here, I've, I've used the questions, the prepositions in um, connected with money. What do you spend most money blank on? It's a great little thing, Word Wall. Instead of just going through the course book, question one, question two, question three, it just adds a bit of dynamism for the younger learners, teenagers, or, or even whoever, you know, who like the sort of technical side of it. It gives them that sort of techie element, simple techie element, but, you know, it's more of a digital interface, which I think a lot of people can relate to. Um, and you spin, we won't do it, I won't connect, but quite simply, you could do it as a whole class or they could do it in their breakout rooms in small groups. Again, it's flexible. You click spin and the wheel literally spins. There's the question. You can either give them the prepositions or they have to put it in. And then either the person who spun it answers the question. The person who spun it asks the others the question or there's just a general discussion. Okay, it's called word wall. Very, very, very straightforward. And when you've done one, so you spin, what do you spend most money on? We discuss it, we talk about it. You can click eliminate and you can remove that question from the wheel to avoid repeating the question. Okay. Ah, Melinda, hi, how are you doing? Your little ones adore, adore Word Wall. Yeah, a little ones and maybe not so little ones as well. You can see in the bottom corner of my screen, wordwall.net. 
okay? And it doesn't, it doesn't have the wheel. The wheel is only one that I think is fun. There's all sorts of other little activities as well. So again, it's just kind of just taking the course book exercise. It took me five minutes to do this. Um, and then you've got it, okay? Uh, it's a great little thing. And as I said, it just gives a break from the course book. It just adds a bit of dynamism. It's maybe a little more related to, it's a bit more fun perhaps. And of course you can use this wheel for all kinds of things, lots of questions and so on and so on. Okay, so there are two little, very simple, straightforward apps that we can use just to, to adapt, develop the material. And as I said, it takes five minutes literally to do that. Okay. Make and do. So what I want to do for the remaining, let me, I'm having a quick look at my thing. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, I like as uh, I just like to look at how uh, other ways we can exploit the online interface. Zoom, Teams. I presume most of us use Zoom or Teams. Okay, so there's the make and do we looked at before. Here's a great little game. Can you see me? Looking very serious. What am I doing? Which make and do expression am I doing? Anybody? What am I doing? Can you see me? I'm speaking, but a make and do, I'm making a decision. I'm, yeah, calling, okay. I am, make a phone call. So this is a classic game that uh, I've been using in the classroom for a long time, most of my teaching career. Uh, we used to do that, didn't we? But nobody does that anymore. This is a phone call, isn't it, you know? That's how we hold the phone, look. Not this one, but maybe you could still do this one. Uh, this is a simple game. You do your make and do, you do your practice. You then get the students to think of one or two expressions with make or do. Make a phone call, make a decision, make a mess. Okay, do the homework, do some ironing, etc. And then you mime it. It works in the classroom, but it's one of those things that can work on Zoom. Everybody shouts out, make a phone call. And then what you do, the next person has to repeat your mime. Well, I'm, I'm instinctively doing, doing this. The, the next person has to repeat your mime. Everybody shouts, make a phone call. And then they do their own one. Um, do the ironing and everybody shouts it out. It works online. It's the kind of thing, the thinking is, would that work online? And the answer is yes. And as you can see, most of the students seem quite as though they're enjoying it. Well, they were teachers, okay? Simple game, but it works. Uh, and it's very cooperative because they help each other and so on and so on, okay? Here's another one that kind of works online. Great to make them turn their cameras, Daphne. Yes, again, it depends on how you teach. Do you have cameras on? Do you have cameras off? Again, it really does depend on the situation. Um, here's another one, a classic one, Picasso sentences, draw the sentence, good for revision. Let's practice adjectives, tired and hungry. Let's practice the past tense or time adverbials. The history of semiotics. I gave a talk on semiotics last month. That's maybe for university students. Again, they draw their picture. You can send them a chat or they can choose a picture or you give them a sentence okay 20 plus students yeah i mean again a common sense maybe you could put them in groups you could probably have 20 online doing this you know 20 images on the screen um possibly and here we are again with those pictures little yeah i'm going shopping what's this one i'm thirsty and so on and so on okay uh it works nicely online. It particularly works online because if you do it in the classroom, you can't really show your picture to the whole classroom because it'd have to be a huge picture. Whereas online, you hold it up to the camera and everyone can see it. We have a guessing game and it's fun. OK, so again, it's this simple idea. What of our traditional tried and tested favorite activities? What will particularly work online with maybe the other little tweak? OK, and again, Everybody seems as though they're quite enjoying themselves, most people. Here's another one, another classic one. Lower levels, the classic third person S. I like rock music. 
Marta. And Marta says, John likes third person S rock music and I like classical. Olga. And Olga says, John likes rock music, Marta likes classical and I like jazz. Johan. Okay. A simple little thing, something that I, I used to do in the classroom a long, long time ago, but it works online because of this interface, because of the cameras. Yeah, you don't really need it on camera. It's just a simple thing. This is very simple third person S. You could do it for past tenses. I watched a film last night. John watched a film. I played a computer game. John watched a film. Marta played a computer game and I cooked dinner and so on and so on. Simple, Michael Angelo, yes, it's simple yet interactive, you know. And again, it's just thinking, what are these nice simple activities that we can exploit lend themselves to online? So we'll just look at a couple more before I finish. Maybe you've done this. Okay, so, you know, you hold something up, see like this. What is it? Anyone like to guess? Anyone like to guess what this is? I'll give you the next picture. Any suggestions? What am I showing you? Paper. Yes, Milena, it is paper, but what? it's a specific bit of paper. It's not a notepad. It's not a banner. It's Well, there's a ceiling in the background. Yes, maybe that was a, a, a very clever joke. It's a post-it note now. Okay, how does that, does that give you a bit more of a clue? It's not a newspaper. Any suggestions? ID, no, it's not ID. It's not a passport. I can see with the stitching how you might think it looks like a passport. We're getting closer, aren't we? Mm, now this is connected with something when we were talking about a famous person you admire. This is kind of connected. It's a ticket, Samaya, it's a ticket. What, what, it's a ticket for a concert, Natalia, well done. Good. What concert is it a ticket for? Nirvana, Monica. Well done. Excellent. A round of applause for Monica. She, she was the first person to say. This was actually a ticket for um, the Nirvana concert that never happened. You can see the date, the 4th of April, 1994. I had this ticket. Kurt Cobain sadly died on the 5th of April, 1994. This was a concert that very sadly never happened. So maybe you do this kind of activity. As I said, you know, if you're just a little bit careful, I've just got a random piece of paper here, but you know, you can blur it out. Yeah, you know, show little bits. It doesn't have to be a ticket, all sorts of things. The students can then do it themselves, but this could be a lead in to a lesson on music. Okay, and here's something from Language Hub B1. This is again, another exercise unit that I wrote all about music. And that little exercise with the Nirvana ticket could be a lead in, okay? But again, it's just thinking, how can I exploit the online environment? And then the students can, okay, go find something connected with music and you do the same, or maybe not do the same either as open class or in their groups. Okay, I'm gonna put you in pairs or in groups, small groups, find three things in common. Nice and simple, okay, we both like rock, we both don't like rap, my favorite singer is, and so on and so on. You could then maybe do a word whirl wheel, leading discussion questions. This unit has some leading discussion questions, you could use those, you could add some more, you could create a little word whirl wheel, and they do that again, open class or in groups. And what we have got in the class, Desert Island Discs, where you can think, okay, this is a famous program. You are stuck on a desert island. You can take three songs with you. What three songs do you take and why? Okay. So I'm kind of going to finish there. Uh, I think we've just about got to the 40 minutes. In fact, my clock says exactly 40 minutes. I'm not sure what time I started, but it's uh, 40 minutes from, from the hour. Um, just to finish with a couple more quotes. Griffiths and Cahoon, students learn more effectively when their feelings, opinions, experiences, and knowledge are valued and crucial to the success. 
That's another way of saying what we said at the beginning. It's the need to get meanings across and the pleasure experienced when you have some agency, some voice, some say that achieves, that motivates second language acquisition. So I hope that was interesting for you. As I said, you know, we didn't want to, that you, you're probably much more familiar in OFA with the, the apps and the technology and the things you can do. What I wanted to look at was, you know, a bit of old school, if you like, how we can take some traditional, regular, tried and tested activities, and with a bit of creative thinking, just how we can maybe make them a bit more dynamic, a bit more interesting online. There are my um, social medias. Please, it'd be great to, if, to connect, to keep in touch. Hopefully I'll see you in your countries at some point for some workshops. Um, I don't know whether we have time for questions, so I'm going to stop the share. Uh, hi. And, um, hi, John. Hi. So anyway, <laughs> I hope that was okay for everybody. I'm done. Yeah, wonderful. Lots of wonderful comments. If you <laughs> you cannot take a look at all the all the comments because more than a thousand. So I imagine. Wow. One point uh, one k. Yeah. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Just maybe just one question because some people were asking about um, uh, big groups, no? How to manage big big groups of all the, the ideas in, in general terms, probably. Well, again, this is one of you know this is one of those questions that kind of depends. Question, I guess it depends on who they are. You know, what age? What's their general level of motivation anyway? Are they po a large group of postgrad university students or are they a large group of children? Again, I don't have a simple answer to that. I think again, just a bit of creative thinking, you know, can I, can I put them in breakout rooms and, and form three smaller groups? Again, what do we mean by a large group? I mean, you know, to some 15 is a large group, to some 40 is a large group. Uh -huh. um, obviously the larger the group, the less interaction and interpersonal communication there's gonna be. So I, I really don't have an answer to that. You know, I, I think, you know, if you can train the learners up, make the material intrinsically motivating and interesting and relatable and doable and create smaller groups in breakout rooms as i just said is one way around it you know so in, in fact have sort of like three separate groups three separate classes if you like for certain sections i really don't have an answer to that um you know i don't have first-hand experience of teaching large groups i'm afraid you know the largest i would do is a maybe a teacher training session with 20 or so or my teaching classroom with say a dozen or, or a little bit more than a dozen 15 maybe yeah yeah I but in general terms i think that i agree with you now the, the the groups are, are, are the idea no here yes i think that's one way but again you know the, the essence of what i'm saying intrinsically interesting motivating material think about how to make it even more motivating and hopefully even though you've got bigger groups you'll still engage people and they'll engage with the material yeah well thank you john it's been an amazing session believe me i think it's interesting uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very interesting. And many people were asking about um, the the book, no? And I'm going to talk a little bit about the book. So thank you, John. Really Do I have again. it here? Do I have a, I have uh, a copy here somewhere? Yeah, I'm wonderful. sure you can it to them. Do I have? Yeah, a copy? Sorry, uh, sorry. I say, do I have a copy? I have a copy just here on my shelf that I can show one, people. Just just one second. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah, many people, many many people were requesting for a sample you will receive a sample guys remember at your mail oh that's it and that's the it, has one beautiful, it has a beautiful design that's it's something that nobody, nobody mentions but it's, <laughs> it's a great color it's a great design yeah. yeah uh i'm sure you or will will be talking more about it but this is the level that i co-wrote and the material the exercises that we looked at in the talk are taken directly from here exactly so thank you john it's been amazing thanks a lot and uh, well okay. now i'm going to tell you I'm going to disappear. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye, John. Nice to meet Good you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks, thanks. Thanks to you, right? So, uh, well, in, as you all saw in John's session, well, we saw the, how flexible the digital and also how motivating language hub is. Remember, he just mentioned that about the activities that he, he did. Well, they, they were taken from language hub. So thanks to uh, this uh, variety of real world communication activities, modern topics you're going to find in language hub, uh, you're going to create plenty of opportunities for students to master their speaking skills. Uh, they're, uh, they're going to bridge the, the gap between the classroom and the real world, which is something that we always need. Also, uh, well, there are lots of digital tools, uh, lovely platforms. Uh, we have an interact, interaction in a very convenient way 
We also help stu students and we also help teachers with lots of tools, um, motivating topics, motivating activities. Also, uh, you, can, uh, you can use it for online classes, hybrid classes, face-to-face -face classes as you wish. And well, I am pretty sure you're interested because you were requesting for the samples and stuff. Remember, you're going to receive it to your mails, but also if you want to take a look at macmillan.com uh, slash uh, language hub, uh, you're going to you're going to see the levels you're going to see the scope and sequence and everything you need to to see there because um, you can also take a look at the, some videos because there are some videos from the guardian you can download the samples you can do lots of stuff so please take a look at this wonderful wonderful material and i'm pretty sure you're going to like it and you're, you're going to want to teach with it <laughs>